This week on CrossFeed. How to really take off the Scientologists. The future of the ELCA. Does religion lead to more teen births? More female pastors coming? And one more time, is Barack Obama the Antichrist? Welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. Oh, man, he, he says that. It just rolls off the tongue now. But, you know, it's, it's sort of like Jay Leno. Um, you know, he used to say, hi, everybody, welcome to The Tonight Show. And then, you know, they'd go out and go, Kevin Eubanks in The Tonight Show Band. And now he's got, it's like Kevin Eubanks in The Primetime Band. I figure, um, you know, we've been talking about that, and you know, he's he's probably, for one, he's got the teleprompter right there to remind him, um, but you know, he also probably sat there and like practiced that over and over just to make sure he said it right. Dale's been practicing. Oh, by the way, Pastor Jim Butler out in St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, and uh, well, I hope you've had a good week, Dale. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and my, my life would be perfect if I could find my shoelaces. <laughs> my shoelace broke, and it broke again. And the thing is, before we moved, I one of them had already broken. And I looked all over, and, and, and I went out, bought some new shoelaces, never got around to actually relacing them. And then forgot I had them. Said, we really got to buy some new shoelaces. And went out bought another pack they're in they're in a box somewhere i think they're in this box sitting right next to me but there's a lot of stuff in that box so i a perfect well perfect life with shoelaces you are an easy man to please i, I you know i'll tell you what do me a favor go out tomorrow buy the shoelaces send me a buck you know send me the bill i'll pay them for you if it'll give you the perfect life to have shoelaces okay <laughs> I want to be responsible for Dale's perfect life. <laughs> so, um, more exciting news for me this week is I was elected to be our uh, delegate to the Senate convention next summer. So I'm very excited about that. I'm very honored. Um, and uh, we will see how that goes. Now, you, you talked about using the teleprompter here. That uh, automatically reminds me of President Obama because he always <laughs> has the as a matter of fact, they even have the blog there from the teleprompter. Um, so let's uh, – uh, the, but the question is, of course, about our, our president is, is he really the Antichrist? You know, and yes, we have talked about this before. I don't mean yes to answer the question, but yes, we have – you know, this is this is a, a rehash, okay? Um, and what this is – yeah, um, <sighs> In, there was a, a recent survey done, a public policy polling firm decided to poll New Jersey residents asking if they think President Obama is the Antichrist. You, you, you kind of wonder where this came from, you know? Um, you know, whose, whose idea was it to do this? But 8% said yes. 79% said no, and 13% said not sure. And so they're taking, the, they always take the not sures and lump them in with whoever they want to, you know, make the extremists. So then at that point, if you lump them together, you know, you've got uh, 21% that, um, that are saying either, uh, either yes, he is, or there's a decent possibility. There is evil there that does not sleep. And, uh, so, and then, so there's been, uh, um, a, the, uh, the video on YouTube that's gotten, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of hits. Um, I, I tried to, uh, to download it and to put it into the, uh, the, the show to insert it, but I didn't get the audio. And, but you can, if you just go to, uh, to YouTube and type in Barack Obama Antichrist, um, it, it comes up, you can watch it. And, um, or you can go to Snopes about Obama Antichrist, and it's right there. I, I, it was much easier because there was about 200 different videos on Barack Obama being the Antichrist that, that I the found. First one. Um, I found, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, the, 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 it argues that 
uh, Jesus in um, Luke 10, uh, where he says, I saw Satan fall from um, heaven like lightning, and argues that the Hebrew word for lightning is Barak, which actually it is. So there's lightning, and that uh, um, the word for heaven is uh, Bama, um, which it really isn't. It's really Shemayim, but that's another point. And that the what's called the Hebrew wow consecutive is pronounced O. So we have Satan falling from heaven. He, they said Satan Barack Obama. Uh, of course, everybody knows he's from Massachusetts. He's really Irish. Part of the Obamas. <laughs> the, you know, O'Callaghan's. <laughs> and the O'Connors. <laughs> oh. Yeah, and and uh, the wall consecutive is either pronounced as a W or uh, as a V, depending on which uh, tradition of of translation you're familiar with. I've I've actually had teachers in both, uh, which really messed me up when I got to seminary and switched uh, pronunciations. But uh, but it, you know, but he, he, it might be a W, it might be a V. It's never an O. No. No, that's that's something else entirely. The, now, the symbol actually looks the same without the. They might have got but... this idea though. Hail to the king, baby. Okay, but they might have got the idea of the Antichrist, you know, from the school kids singing there in New Jersey. You know, did you see this? They are singing the, you know, yep. and what did they sing? Yellow, red, yellow, black, or white, all are equal in his sight. Barack Hussein <laughs> Obama. You know, that's yeah. you know. Yeah, it, you know, and that's that's the thing that really came out of this. Um, this whole poll is that you've got it's, it's there's just like a lot of extremists because um now i love how they say right-wing conservative isn't right-wing conservative kind of redundant it's like left-wing liberal um but they have claimed on blogs that are I'm a left-wing it, conservative <laughs> but uh you know they they talk about this the one who speaks blasphemy against god and um and all this but then but they also say that uh um uh, um it's also there's a lot of uh birthers uh that say that um uh, 21 percent of new jersey voters believe obama was not born in this country Uh, i've heard that there's some question about i'm you know i don't know um he could solve the problem real quickly if he just uh publishes birth certificate or parts of it but um but uh thirty three percent believe he's not a natural born citizen um and but on on the other hand it also says thirty two percent of New Jersey Democrats are truthers that believe that George Bush had advanced knowledge of the nine eleven attacks. So it's on both sides. <laughs> In fact there you've got, you know That's just uh, Jersey. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the other thing. This is New Jersey. <laughs> you know? So, you know, I can't really, I've, I've never been to New Jersey. That's what, that's what living that close to New York City does to you. You know, that's what the commutes every day do to you. <laughs> you know, that's what, it, they call it the Garden State. Everybody else calls it the world's biggest parking lot. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, so the, the question here... What it comes down to is not only are is this you know you can't even call it scholarship these claims that are being made, all right, but what it comes down to is that the antichrist is described in the Bible, uh, for one doesn't necessarily refer to one single human being. Um, the other thing is it refers to specifically refers to someone who comes out of the church, right, and you know, some figure within the church. And while um, Obama says he's Christian and and have no reason to doubt that, um, I disagree with some of his moral stance, but that's, you know, he says he's Christian and and I know plenty of Christians that I disagree with them on various moral stands, but um, he he's not a church figure. He's not a pastor. He's not a, you know, a bishop or any sort of, of, of religious authority. He never claimed to be, uh, he likes to quote the Bible. Um, that's all politics. Yeah. So, 
I don't know. I, I, I think that the claims that, you know, about as far as, oh, well, he's, um, you know, speak blasphemy against God. There are things that George W. Bush said that I thought were rather blasphemous, too, when he talked about that, um, that Muslims and Christians, that and Jews, we all worship the same God and, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. And there was, I mean, there was some, some comments that he made that, that I thought were, uh, you know, maybe not blasphemy, but certainly, uh, not what I consider good, solid Christian doctrine. Um, so, but, you know, people were able to let that one go because they agreed with him politically. Way back when, when uh, you probably were in diapers still, and uh, Jimmy Carter hosted the uh, Camp David talks between Israel and uh, Egypt, and they signed those Camp David Accords there. My brother was working at Ford, and this guy told my brother, he says, just wait, this is the beginning of the end. Seven more years, and Jesus is going to return now. This is going to be the beginning. In three and a half years, uh, the Antichrist will reveal himself. This is the beginning of it. And my brother said, Jimmy, what, what do you think about that? Of course, I was only in high school at the time, you know. But I looked at him, and I said, Jimmy Carter's the Antichrist? I hope Satan can do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and the problem with with sort of nailing it down to a person and then and then saying, um, "Oh well, this person," and then so we can figure out the dates and all that kind of stuff. All right, that means that I have you know three and a half years or whatever to tell my friend about Jesus, or you know, I've I've got time before I do um, any any sort of evangelism and. Um, you know, and, and I can I can kind of map things out and make my plans and all that kind of stuff. Well, friends, Jesus could come back before we finish recording this, right? And uh, you know, it's entirely possible. It's also possible you can go to Jesus before we're done recording this too. I had a member oh, of my right. church, uh, uh, the mother of one of my members of the church, woke up yesterday morning doing fine. And her husband said, are you, are you feeling okay? She goes, yeah, I feel great. I rolled back in her head. She died. Had a heart attack. Hmm. Dead before she hit the floor. So, you know, we, we don't know. And Joe, we always need to be ready. Always need to be prepared. That's the, that's the key thing of the Bible. And instead of trying to nail down who or what or anything. And plus, of course, you know, that they pull that term Antichrist and throw that into Revelation. By the way, guess what? The word Antichrist is nowhere in the book of Revelation. It's uh, in Sean letter. So um, it's faulty exegesis. It's faulty stuff. Uh, it's really, you know, let's, let's, let's move on here. Let's get something more interesting. Um, let's see. Where should we head to? Um, well, we're talking about Obama as the Messiah. Uh, virgin birth. Let's talk about teen births. Uh, let's, 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 uh... Okay. Yeah, I'm talking about dumb, badly written articles. <laughs> okay. So they, they have this. This this is from M MSNBC, and they are going through a study, and I can't remember who did this study. Um, but um, it said that those who the, the the ones that are states that have higher religious values uh, tend to be the um, also have the highest teen birth rates. And uh, so, and asking then if there's a correlation of this because. Um, uh, 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 you know, because you, you teach these kids, uh, um, you tell them not to have sex, but they do. But you don't tell them to use the to use uh, any type of birth control. You tell them that's bad because you don't teach them abstinence, and then they get carried away. Next thing you know, the girl winds up being pregnant. Is that kind of the the whole the gist of the article here? Well, that's how it starts out. But the problem is, you talk about badly written articles. I mean, the author of this article is bouncing around all over the place. 
because, you know, really what it comes down to is, is there's all kinds of speculation as to what this data means. And, but the problem with, uh, with data like this is it's correlation. It's not causation. And it's a, um, it's a logical fallacy to say that it's a cause. Right. And so they kind of bounce back and forth. They say that, but then they say, well, but um, in less religious states or less, and by religious meaning conservative religion, uh, they use a couple examples, um, that eight statements. Um, two of the ones include, there's only one way to interpret the teachings of my religion, and scripture should be taken literally word for word. Well, I wouldn't even agree with that one, and I consider myself pretty conservative. But uh, I certainly don't interpret the Psalms literally. I don't interpret Revelation literally. You know, this stuff was intended to be taken symbolically. Hmm. Um, but um, now, well, let's be reasonable. Anyway, the, the um, in in more uh, sort of liberal areas, uh, you have um, more abortions. Right. Well, so much for your contraception argument. No, they're just aborting them. Well, now they say, well, but even then accounting for the abortions, the study team still found the state's level of religiosity could predict their teen birth rate. Um, higher religiosity, the higher the teen birth rate on average. But it's like, okay, so which is worse? <laughs> okay, let's look, let's, let's look at that. The higher the religiosity, the higher the birth rate. Then let's look at the table down below. Most religious state, Mississippi... Highest teen birth rate, Mississippi, one on one. So we have the correlation. But of course, then there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot more births in black families out of wedlock births, and Mississippi has uh, a huge black population. No, thank you. I take it black, like my men. Number two birth rate is New Mexico. Religiousness is 22. Oh. Okay, we're down the middle of the pack there. Well, let's go to number three then. <clears throat> uh, that's Texas, and it's number 12 on religiousness. So it's in the top fourth, but it's not in the top ten. Hmm. Well, let's go down to uh, Arkansas, and that's number four birth rate, number seven religiousness. Okay, we're just top, top, top ten. Arizona, number five for birth rate, number 33 for um, religiousness. Nevada. Now, if you're in a religious state, if you want a bunch of Bible thumpers, we're talking Nevada. <laughs> yeah. There, it's high because of all the, I the mean, prostitutes. Have you, ever, I mean... <laughs> you know those prostitutes pray. All of whom are carrying their Bibles. Yeah. Yeah, their Bible thumper That's means right. something completely different. But, Sorry. I mean, yeah, number seven, birth rate, number 34, religiousness. In other words, their own table doesn't bear out the, 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 the uh, argumentation they're trying to make. Yeah. So, but then they go on, um, they've got another uh, separate research uh, study that, uh, first of all, they point out that African-American women on average tend to underreport their abortions, which means they could also underreport the likelihood that they are pregnant. So... Um, if you've got a high number of African American women, you're going to run into um, skewed results. All right, that's just a tendency. All right, and then um, the more religious women are, according to this other study, the more religious women are less likely to engage in risky or sex behaviors, and as a result, they're less likely to have premarital pregnancy. All right, exactly the opposite. So <laughs> there goes your study. We've got conflicting studies here, but. The thing is, I saw this article all over Facebook and, you know, and, and just all over the place that people are going, oh, see, see, it's those religious people. They're the problem. Well, then you add to it also that Mississippi, all right, Mississippi has a high teen birth rate. It also has a high teen marriage rate, all right? 18 and 19 year olds are still teenagers. All right, and I don't even know what the age of consent is in Mississippi. It might be younger than that. All right, so I don't know, but I heard you can, you know, if they get divorced, they're still cousins, so you know, it's okay. <laughs> Boy, no control. Great. There you go, the YouTube comments. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
Hey, I used to live in Kansas City. I was pretty close to Arkansas, so I'm used to, you know, insulting those, those people down, down that area. But, uh, you know, well, you know, it, it doesn't, yeah, the, the sixth most religious state, by the way, is Utah. And to go on the other side of this, and where do they wind up on, on, uh, um, and they were the 34th state in the, um, teen birth area. Um, Alabama and South Carolina were number two and three, but they were 12 and 13 in uh, teen birth. I mean, it, yeah, it, it doesn't, I don't know. It, it, yeah, it, it, it's, it's one of these things, I think, where they, they put this great headline, but then everything under there really doesn't, you know, doesn't really show it. Or as they simply put down in the one, two, three, four, fifth paragraph, the study comes with significant caveats. <laughs> Big time. Yeah. All right. So. Well, actually, the fourth one says the results don't say anything about cause and effect. Um, though st- study researcher Joseph Strayhorn uh, um, uh, 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 um, offers a speculation of the most probable explanation. I love this. The speculation of the most probable. In other words, he's guessing. <laughs> this Stop is purely up. opinion, you know. Sure. But but you know, it's it. What he's really saying is, I don't know, but it seems likely that. Right. So if you're, you, you know, know, friends uh, around the water cooler, bring which this is his up. own best guess. Yeah. You know, this is. Is it look? Take a look at the actual study. Take a look at the actual results. This was a. This was. The, the findings don't even match up with the with the news articles. You know, they're they're sort of picking and choosing data from the findings, um, but it it doesn't actually have a, a correlation. So, um, and then there's so many different explanations, and there's other studies that you know that show exactly the opposite. So, don't let people kind of push you around with this one. You know, because there's just so many factors. And the other thing is, for that matter, they're going on at looking at entire states. Okay? Well, for one, going from state to state isn't even uh, um, necessarily a, a valid thing because, you know, okay, I lived in uh, I, I lived in Iowa before this, all right? And, you know, out in the middle of rural Iowa, it was a whole lot different than downtown Des Moines. All right? I mean, it was completely different. And so to, to look at an entire state, you've got a, a mix in any state of multiple cultures, you know? So to, to sort of make these broad uh, general statements, you know, you got to look at, you can, you know, 37% and, um, percent of all statistics are made up on the fly anyway, <laughs> you know, including that it's one. It's not a hot. It's eighty-seven point three percent. Sorry. <laughs> Get it right. If you're gonna make it up, make it up good. And always put the decimal point with something after it. That way, it really sounds official. <laughs> um. Hey, let's do a follow-up here from a couple of weeks ago in our interview uh, on the ELCA. Yep. Let's head over there and talk about them. Um, this weekend, there is going to be a big meeting in Fishers, Indiana, uh, the Lutheran Coalition for Reform, better known as Lutheran Corps, is going to be meeting. Now, it's interesting. This this was supposed to be originally supposed to be at a church. They thought they maybe get a couple hundred, and uh, they you know got at least twelve hundred um, registrations, and so they're uh, uh, one. They're actually going to hold it. Um, holding it at Holy Spirit Pastor Parish at Geist Catholic Church is where it's going to wind up being held now. Uh, maybe that won't even be big enough. I mean, uh, who knows how many they'll find an evangelical megachurch. Um, Lutheran Core is really uh, an interesting mix of uh, the Word Alone Network and um, churches, uh, part, part of the Lutheran Churches for Mission for Christ and some of these other groups. It's really a mixture of the, <laughs> and we have, we really kind of have these two same groups in Missouri Synod too, the Confessing Evangelicals and the Evangelical Catholics. Um, 
and I, I'm be honest with you, as I looked at those two terms, I probably confess myself a confessing evangelical. Um, but uh, uh, pro- probably a good term for me. I, I think I've I think I finally found the term I'm most at home with, because uh, I'm definitely not an evangelical Catholic. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see what kind of decisions. But this is a group of people who are very, very saddened at uh, the ELCA social statement and the decisions they made on, um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, the ordination of gays. And um, it's going to be interesting. Nobody seems to know what's going to happen. It, already, though, by the way, some of the largest churches in the ELCA have left. I just read an article today that one of the largest that the largest ELCA church in the state of Virginia is supposed to vote this weekend on leaving the ELCA. Anyway, uh, Dale, your comments on this Lutheran core meeting? Uh, you know, to me, it just seems sort of um, inevitable. Uh, you know, I, I think I think what this does point out to people is that the ELCA. Uh, as a church body, and and really as as a collection of individual people, individual churches, um, individual pastors, uh, is what we find there is that it is not so much the sort of bastion of liberalism that everybody makes it out to be, um, but rather there's a lot of people like that in it. But they're by no means, you know, maybe they're the majority. But there's plenty of people in the ELCA that completely disagree with this stuff. That um, that are in it for various reasons, whether it be um, their you know pastors that don't want to lose their pensions, um, or pastors whom uh, I've met that say, uh, you know, I don't agree with this, but if I leave and if all the confessional pastors leave, then you know, who's going to stand up and fight for the truth? Um, you know, and, and so there's, there's all kinds. I met one of the ELCA pastors here, um, here in town last week that is, um, that said, you know, I, I disagree with this stuff and, and he's actually planning a church. Um, and, and he says, I don't know, you know, what I'm going to do. There's a decent chance that, that once we actually, um, you know, incorporate or, or whatever because they're you know right now they're it's just sort of a collection of people um that we might end up when we finally become an official church that it won't be an elca church and we'll have to pay back the grants and stuff that we got from the elca um he did tell me something interesting though um he said that the churches elca churches that do decide to leave um that the elca does not own their property and that that they can keep their property, and I always, I had always heard that um, that that was part of the deal. It was like the Episcopalians that you leave um, your property is owned by the um, by the ELCA. That was true of the LCA. Um, the, it really depends on what the Constitution says. Now, like I said, the largest church in Virginia is voting to leave. Um, now, uh, what it um, and the letter from their pastor reminded them that they have to have two thirds of the of the people vote in favor of leaving uh, two meetings in a row. Uh, the first one will be held this weekend. The next one will be held in January. Except they have to be so many months apart. And if they don't have two thirds voting to leave, then whoever wants to stay with the ELCA will get the property. That's what their constitution okay. says. And that makes so sense. So it really depends. Um, it really depends on what the you know the individual church's constitution says. Um, so that's that's where it can make a difference. So, but the, it's important to note that I think, um, and you know, especially because newer churches that were not um, that were formed after that whole merger, you know, they. They don't fall into mm-hmm. those sort of separate categories of ALC and uh, LCA and, you know, and the very smaller groups that were part of that. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, it, I don't know. It's just really interesting to, to watch this pan out. I, I really, I guess for me, the biggest thing is my heart just really goes out to the people that are stuck in the middle of this. You know, I, I talked about how, you know, how, happy my life is, you know, 
and because I don't have to deal with this stuff. All right. I've, you know, and I've got plenty of, of, uh, of problems that I'm helping people deal with and, and stuff like that. And, and some of them are a whole lot more serious than this. Okay. Um, but at the same time, this is, um, boy, this is, this is the kind of thing that's really hard to deal with because, you know, people, they rely on their church to be there for them, to, to, to bring them the truth, you know? And then when their church isn't doing its job, you know, when I've got somebody that's hurting and I can go and, and tell them, you know, about the resurrection and, and to encourage them and, and to say, you know what, um, you know, just keep focusing on the empty tomb and, and, uh, and, and we're going to, you know, everything's going to be okay. Jesus is with you and, and he's going to take care of you. And then, but, you know, people know that if they come to me that I'm going to bring them the word of God and it's going to bring them comfort and it's going to help them and it's going to, and you know, whatever it is that they're dealing with in their life, we're going to, with the word of God is going to help them through that. All right. But then you've got people in the ELCA that are, they're looking for that. They want that. They want their pastor, their church body, um, to bring them the word of God and, and their pastors and, and a lot of, you know, the majority in the church party is saying, well, yeah, the word of God's in there somewhere. And it's like, all of a sudden it's like you pull the rug out from under them. Right. And then you've got pastors that are, um, you know, that, that know the truth and, and, and they're dealing with other pastors, you know, and I remember there have been times where I've talked to other pastors from other denominations and, and they've, they've said stuff that just absolutely shocked me. And I'm like, where do you get off saying that as a Lutheran or not? I'm sorry, not a Lutheran as a Christian pastor. And you know, that that's not even Christian. And, um, you know, it's, it's not even a question of, is this sort of Lutheran versus Methodist or, you know, or something like that. It was like, what are you what are you talking about? You know, that's just, you've got no reason to say that you, you got no, no right calling yourself a pastor and saying something like that. Right. Because it is just flat out blatantly against the Bible. I've been rereading, uh, Lou Geert's wonderful book, um, the hammer of God. And in the last section, we, we have pastor Torvik and his friend, Gunnar Schoenstatt. And Gunnar keeps talking about how you can go beyond the Bible. And the Holy Spirit tells you new things. And uh, you can, you know, reinterpret it all. And I'm, I was sitting there reading this book today and reading what he had to say and going, man, does that ever describe what the ELCA is? I, I tell you this story, too. I think I've said this one before. So, you know, go out there, get your beer, folks. Um, a friend of mine was part of a dialogue group with the uh, ELCA uh, up here and um, on the issue of homosexuality. And he did a, an exegesis of the texts on it. And this guy, by the way, is absolutely brilliant. He's published a couple books on cults. He's working on his Ph.D. in uh, systematic theology right now at uh, St. Andrews University in Scotland. I mean, he is just very, very top-notch theologian. Uh, and he was called to teach at the Fort Wayne Seminary, but turned that, turned, turned him down because he wanted to work on his degree. But anyway, so he's just this really, really smart. And he's telling me that the um, one of the participants on the other side said, well, you know, you did a great, great exegesis on that text, but if you ask me, the Bible's just written for white heterosexual males. Yeah, there you go. And we were all sitting there going, Jesus is white? I yeah. thought he was you. I thought these people were all, you know, Semitic. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the you know the the, the Jesus in the pictures, you know, <laughs> not, ah. not the Jesus in the Bible. <laughs> okay, it was the blonde Jesus from uh, Johnny Cash's Miracle Road movie. There, I uh, now we get it. Okay, <laughs> so uh, now, uh, folks from Lutheran Corps, uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing what happens. Uh, and what direction that goes for you guys. We do keep the ELCA in our prayers and the folks at Lutheran Corps. 
Um, yeah. so speaking please, of... Oh, just everyone, please pray for the people in the ELCA. Pray for the pastors. Mm -hmm. Pray for the um for the for the, the the lay people that are you know looking for direction and 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 also very much pray for those who are leading it down the wrong path okay and and pray that that God will reveal his truth to them because man God's truth is so great I can't I just can't imagine why people would want to throw that away it's just you know yeah there's certain parts of it that are hard to deal with but once you really understand them they're really great too, you know? So just really pray for those people. And, um, you know, they just, they need God's love. Why are they, why are they throwing it with God's truth away? It's called, it's called the sin. Uh, it's that first commandment. I want to be God. Um, speaking of, uh, false doctrine here. Um, <clears throat> There's an interesting study from um, uh, 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 George Barna. Uh, I was talking about um, that the fact that the number of female senior pastors has doubled in the last 10 years. Um, 10%. Uh, now, now, it's interesting. Okay, I, and, I, I, and here's a wonder of when I think a senior pastor, I think of a church that has a staff. But if he says one in ten churches employs a woman as a senior pastor, doubled the percentage from a decade ago. But I think they understand senior pastor also a sole pastor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I got from this is that like I would be considered a senior pastor, um, you know, even though I am the only uh, professional church worker on staff. Well, right. okay. I, I mean, I mean, we have preschool teachers, you know, but as far as a trained theological, you know. Uh, we don't have DCEs or anything like that. Right. I would be considered the senior pastor as well. Uh, although, you know, so, yeah, I'm that, that, that you know, to get to think that terminology. So the, they argue then, but 10 percent of the churches in the United States uh, currently have a, a, a woman pastor. Let's put it that way, a female pastor. Uh, and almost 60 percent of them work in mainline churches, United Methodist, the ELCA, the Episcopal Church. Uh, and interestingly enough, only 23% of male pastors uh, or sole pastors or senior pastors are affiliated with mainline churches. Well, now, this is, I really had to read this closely because the numbers that they're throwing around, you, you really had to read closely to see what exactly they're saying. All right, so 58% um, of the women work in these mainline churches. I actually thought it would have been higher because those are the number one, they're the largest church bodies. And number two, most of the non mainline churches, the evangelical churches don't allow women pastors. So I was actually surprised that it was only 58%. Where are the rest of these women pastors? You know, there's no, oh, um, assembly of God would ordain women. Oh, do they? Uh, oh, know. yes. Okay. Yes, some of God, uh, Southern Baptist, and all uh, some Southern Baptists some too. Do. Yep, yep. We'll um, talk about that. And uh, the, uh, you know, there's an, uh, uh, what, what would be the other one? Um, there might be another. I, I mean, I went to Gordon Conwell, and which is you know one of the leading places in evangelical feminism. And so you met some of these people who you know in, in some of these church bodies. Um, and then uh, Fuller has a lot of female, a lot of women uh, studying for the ministry as well. And that's another, another leading evangelical seminary. Okay. So um, they, they are out there. But then the Southern number, 23% of male senior pastors are affiliated with mainline churches. Okay. So there's a lot of evangelical churches that do not, um, uh, do not ordain women. Okay. And so to say only 23% of males, that's not saying only 23% of the pastors in mainline churches are male. It's saying grand total out of all the churches in the country, out of all the male pastors, only 23% of them are, well, I don't even know how that compares as far as the number of churches or the number of, you know, it's, that's kind of a, it's a useless statistic right there. 
Um, because what if only 23% of the, of the churches in the country are mainline, which is not, but I mean, if it were, then it'd be, oh, wow, 100%, you know, so it's, it's kind of a, you know, it's like saying, well, you know, only, uh, only, you know, 4% or whatever of, of, uh, of, of male pastors are Missouri Synod, you know, Lutheran. Well, so what, you know, that's just a commentary on the size of our church body, not, you know, and I made up that number too. But, um, he just makes up all these numbers. <laughs> um, the other one that gets me is he says, yeah, that women, female pastors tend to be more highly educated than their male counterparts, with 77% earning a seminary degree compared to less than two thirds of male pastors, 63%. Okay. But again, where are these women? They're in the main nine churches. That require most, seminary degrees. Almost all of which tend to require yeah, a seminary degree. Um, a lot of these guys out there who um, start um, their own churches, a lot of the independents, may have like a two-year Bible degree or something like that. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I knew a guy that was in the Assemblies of God Church um, that started preaching when he was eight. You know, and he didn't, he actually, uh, became a Missouri Synod Lutheran. Uh, then he went to seminary, but he, you know, he was a, he was a pastor long before he ever went to seminary. I have a brother-in-law who, um, uh, now I don't know if he still is or not. Um, but he was primitive Baptist, also called hard shell Baptist. And they believe if it's not in the Bible, you don't do it. So you can't find Sunday schools in the Bible, so you don't have Sunday schools. And you can't find an organ in the Bible, so you don't have organs. And you don't find seminaries in the Bible, so you don't have seminaries. Um, and so he was a preacher in the you know primitive Baptists. Did he wear a um, like a toga? <laughs> I mean, you know, they don't have coats and ties in the Bible. They don't have socks in the Bible, for that matter. I know, but I look, man. I mean, I'm I, I know, not... I know, I know. But I, you know, I, I keep, I hear about that stuff. It's like, where do you draw the line? You know, <laughs> that's right. Like, but anyway, so that's either. So you know, <laughs> but that's that's part of the part of the, the the whole church thing there. But I mean, so you know, he had no education, and obviously, this sermon sounded like it too. Uh, so it, um, you know. So yeah, that 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 thing of talking about the uh, uh, percentage there, again, that's part of being a lot of them being in the mainline churches versus all churches. Right, and then uh, the next statistic he gives is about incomes. To say male pastors have larger incomes, well, on average, their churches are quite a bit bigger too. You know, all these mega churches. Guess what? Most of them are uh, these. You know, evangelical, non-denominational, and 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 stuff like that, or or maybe assemblies of God or something like that. You don't find a lot of mega churches. I mean, there's some, but you don't find a lot relatively compared to evangelicals in the mainline. You just don't. So you know, consequently, um, you know, a pastor's salary is going to have something to do with the number of people there because you know, if if you're at a church that's got uh, 25 people there on Sunday, um. And and that's your only service, yeah. You're not going to be making you know making a huge salary because uh, unless all all the people showing up are millionaires, um, you're not doing you know th- there's not the money to pay you that. And Joyce Meyer, to the contrary, most uh, you know mega churches are not pastored by 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 women. Right. Um, now up here. Women pastors are all over the place. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, uh, the, the local United Methodist Church is is, is uh, pastored by a woman, but especially you get out a lot of these rural towns, and they have the local, uh, uh, well, what we call the Congos, uh, the UCC churches. They're all old Congregationalist churches, and they're all pastored by women. And that's pretty typical up here. And again, you know, you, you know, uh, uh, there's just not that many, but I mean, there. I mean, there's not that many people go to those churches, but then they're all pastored by women. They're just all over up here, so you know, I, I get. I'm pretty used to it. So, 
in, in the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, we don't have women pastors. Um, and, and you point to different, uh, uh, Timothy and, and things like that. I, I always point to it when people ask me about it, uh, really Ephesians five, um, I think is the biggest reason that we don't have women pastors because the pastor serves as a representative of Christ to his church. And, um, and if you have a woman in there, then, um, you've, you've got a, a, a woman standing in, uh, for Christ to the bride. And, um, it, it's, a. Uh, and, and I, you know, I don't take that, that passage individually. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's the other passages, uh, from Timothy and, and things like that, um, where we see the, where this all ties together. You know, you can't, you can't just prove text and say, oh, chapter and verse right there. You know, it says, um, there's actually a whole bunch of different passages. Uh, so, um, so that's where we're at. That also, though, is the reason that the Missouri Senate is not getting a huge influx of, of people. There's been some, um, but not a huge influx of people from the ELCA because, um, as they mentioned in this article, the ELCA has had women pastors for what, 40 years or something like that. Yeah. 40 yes. years. So, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's a pretty big habit there. Although, um, the one pastor I talked about, uh, with, you know, who met up with the ELCA folks, uh, pastors and did the dialoguing stuff. He told me he's had a dozen members from ELCA churches coming to his church since, uh, this all broke out. And some of the other, a couple of the other pastors up here talked about it. They've had, I haven't had any. I've had um, one. Um, but then when I talked to her afterward, um, she said, I didn't realize you guys were Missouri Synod. <laughs> so I'm looking for an ELCA church. I just moved into the area. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, that was just, <laughs> she found us by accident. <laughs> so it, it had nothing to do with that. So I, you know, I, I really, I'm wondering honestly, uh, with that whole question. Um, I really think that there's a lot of people out there that don't even know what happened. They don't pay attention to national, you know, synodical politics and stuff like that. All right. You know, you go, you go ask people in the Missouri Senate, just your random, um, you know, um, Joe Schmidt or whatever. And, uh, and ask him, you know, what, ask him about the, the blue ribbon task force on restructuring. And guess what? I'll bet you he's never heard of it before. He doesn't know anything about it. You know, I mean, that's true. On the other hand, um, it was interesting. One of the pastors up here talked about a woman who joined his church from the Episcopal Church and had left because of the whole homosexuality issue there. And uh, she went to work, and people said, I guess you're going to have to change churches again. So, you know, I mean, you know, because now you're Lutheran. Now the Lutherans are doing the same thing. And uh, she said she went to her pastor, and she she was really upset about this. And he said, no, that's not us. Um, so... Well, yeah, that's the other problem is people hear Lutheran and, uh, well, that's, that's why, uh, what there was just, uh, um, uh, George, uh, Bullwinkle, uh, sent us the note that it's the anniversary. It was a 10 year anniversary of the, uh, joint declaration on the doctrine of justification, you know, and, uh, back that's coming up. And when that came out, um, the, Al Berry, our um, synodical president at the time, put a, a was it wasn't it a full page article in USA Today? Full page ad. Full, yeah, full page ad. Um, that basically the gist of it was that's not us, and uh, you know, saying that's that's the ELCA, that's not the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. So when you're hearing about this stuff, um, you know, let's just keep, keep, be clear on on who it is we're talking about here. You know, most people saw it and said, "Who's the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod?" <laughs> you know, people just hear Lutheran. It's like, you know, did you know that there's more than one Methodist denomination in the United States? Most people don't. You know, um, and so it, you know, there's a lot of confusion about that kind of thing, and. Um, but you know, I, I encourage people to to talk to your pastors about these things, and um, you know, and whether it be 
whether you be in a, a, in a Missouri Synod church, whether you be in a, in a ELCA church, or whether you be in a Methodist church, or you know, or whatever, and talk to your pastor about you know the the different issues that uh, the, the the Christian church uh, as a whole is dealing with, especially in the United States, and and say you know what what do what does our church teach on this? You know what do we believe the Bible teaches about this, um, and why? And you know, and, and study it and. And, uh, you know, read both sides of the issue. That's, you know, I always tell people when you become a Christian, don't check your brain at the door. Um, you know, think about this stuff, read both sides. All right. Um, you know, and, and I am perfectly happy to have, uh, the, the people from my congregation go and read the, the ELCA, uh, positions that were in favor of the decisions that were made, you know, go read it, see where they're coming from. Right. Cause then you can talk about it. All right. You can't talk about it if you're only here in one side, because then you don't know where the other person's coming from. You don't have any sort of, you know, common ground to, to start from. You don't, you're, you, you're working off of somebody else's assumptions and stuff. And, and, you know, we make assumptions on this show and, you know, we try to give a educated, um, you know, uh, well, opinion, you know, on a lot of this stuff. A lot of it's, is opinion. Um, a lot of it's not, um, but we're not, this is what we do on this show is very different from what we do in the pulpit. You know, in the pulpit, this is the word of the Lord. You know, this is, we're, we're talking straight from God's word. Um, but a lot of the things that, that we do on here, um, you know, we're, we, we talk opinion and, and what do you think about this? And, and it's, um, you know, when you're teaching on God's word, uh, a lot of times that you're, um, well, I mean, I mean, always when you're working from God's word, it's not opinion. You know, this is the word of the Lord, and and so it's opinion. Your opinion doesn't ever enter into it. So it's important to make that distinction. Um. So, so we, we on to Scientology. Yeah. I didn't even get through this whole article. I'm going to let you long. kind of, but it it kind of looked like me. What if who are these people? And what are they doing? Okay, all right. So we've we've heard a lot. This is really um. It's more of a um, sort of a, 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 a historical, like it's almost like a documentary. This is in Wired magazine, okay? Every once in a while we'll get an article in Wired, but you know, usually they're more into technology and stuff like that, and um, and they don't really get into religion very much. Once in, once in a while they'll uh, take some digs at the creationists or something like that, but that's about it. And um, so. What they're talking about here is the group that is commonly known as Anonymous. Um, this is the group that keeps attacking uh, the um, the Scientologists that did a, a what's called a DDoS attack, a, deni- a d- d- distributed denial of service attack, where uh, basically you have um, thousands of computers all hitting a website at once uh, to take down the site. Uh, and uh, they did that to the Scientologists, and um, but really, I think I think what this did, uh, they they sort of look at both sides of this. First of all, they say this anonymous group, all right. A lot of people see them as these sort of freedom fighter kind of people that that are pointing out all the hypocrisy of Scientology and and all that kind of stuff. And what they point out in this article is, all right, you've got to keep in mind who these people are. All right, these are people that hang out on a, a message board called 4chan. All right, and um, what this group, what this group is, basically, they're trolls in internet speak. These are people that like to go around and make trouble. All right, these are people that this is the same group of people that will take um, uh, f- uh, flash, uh, like like graphics that have those those the kind of flashes that trigger um, epileptic seizures in some people. And post them on epileptic discussion boards. All right, they will find um, and and uh, I mean, and this is kind of gross. If you want to skip ahead a few seconds, uh, if you're a little squeamish, but they will find um, video clips of kittens in blenders and posted places. I mean, these are nasty people. Okay, so while some people may agree with what they're doing um, to the Scientologists, which a lot of it is illegal, like a DDoS attack is illegal. Um, it's the thing that generally it's uh, 
mafia, like the Russian mafia likes to do DDoS attacks, uh, to people. Um, and, uh, so you, this is really not just, you know, some idealistic people. The problem is some of the people in there are idealistic and really, you know, want to do, want to sort of bring down what they see as an oppressive group, which doesn't justify their actions, but, you know, in a sort of strange way, their heart's in the right place. Um, but the end don't justify the means. Um, but other people, they're just causing problems. They're just being jerks and they'll do it wherever and however they can. Right now, on the flip side, you've got the Scientologists. All right, the first rule of dealing of, of uh, sort of internet wisdom is don't feed the trolls. Okay, these guys live off of what is uh, sometimes referred to as lols. Um, LOL, laugh out loud. All right, lols um, meaning uh, you know we're doing this for kicks. All right. We're doing this for fun. And the bigger reaction we get, you know, it's like any bully. Um, if you just ignore them, they'll go away. Well, not all of them, but, um, but uh, that's often the case. It's like just, you know, um, and so, but if you, you know, you really want to, um, if, if you want to, if people are, are mocking you and stuff like that, if you go after them, you're just going to rile them up. You know, then you end up with, you know, turning these bunch of jerks into martyrs, you know, it's the worst thing you can do if, you know, and this really, this all started with, um, when, uh, when, uh, Tom Cruise, uh, did that, um, got all weird on Oprah and, uh, so somebody posted it up on, on YouTube and then, the Scientologist had, you know, had it taken down. And the, I mean, this just, if they just left it alone and, you know, and let everybody, you know, kind of get their laughs out of it. And then, you know, it would have blown over, you know, people would have had a good laugh about it. And a week later it would have been forgotten. All right. But instead they went after it. And what they did is they just dragged it out. And they made it, you know, they made a big deal out of it. And then all of a sudden it's all over the news and stuff. And then, and then, um, instead of just being, uh, you know, popular on YouTube, people are going to check this out They're, They They want to go see this, that everybody's talking about that's on the news and, and everything. And, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, it's getting all this publicity. So if the Scientologists wouldn't be so quick to sue, you know, this would have blown over and, and none of this stuff would have happened. Well, I mean, it might have because these, these, uh, uh, 4chan people are, um, are pretty nasty and they'll attack just about anybody. So they probably would have done something at some point. But, you know, when you hear about this group, just because you may agree with their, with their, uh, position on Scientology doesn't mean, you know, it's the whole, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah, these aren't the kind of people you necessarily want as friends. <laughs> Please noticed, by the way, folks, he called you trolls. I didn't. <laughs> Someone who yelled at you, talked about these nasty things. I didn't. Gail. D A L E. <laughs> Ohio. O H I O. You know, the most popular episode that we've ever had. I said it was the it was that interview that we had, but that was actually in recent history. Our most popular episode ever, um, on especially on YouTube, was the one that was the title of it was I O W A while we were talking about uh, extremist Muslim terrorists. <laughs> and, and Jim was talking about exactly where I live. <laughs> <laughs> that episode got more <laughs> more views on YouTube than anything else. Oh, great! <laughs> so, but you know, here's the thing. All right, I'm saying these guys are jerks. Okay, they would take that as See, a compliment. He's calling you names again. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> they take it as a compliment. All right. I mean, you got to read the other. It's a good article. I mean, you know, a lot of the stuff in Wired, I, I really kind of get irritated with and, and annoyed with. But, um, 
this is actually a really well written article. It you know it, it talks about that there's there's all different people, um, in uh, in this in this group, and uh, that that some of them yeah they're you know the bigger jerks they can be the better and um and and that's what they're trying to do and and they they really um they revel in that and in fact they're upset when this w- when the group starts to get some uh some recognition as, as where people start to see them as heroes you know that's when one of the guys covered his body in vaseline and um and and uh, uh some more kind of gross stuff you might want to skip ahead um pubic hair and toenail clippings and um went into the one of the scientologist offices and and just basically desecrated the place um really just nasty disgusting stuff because they were getting too much you know positive press and they didn't want that so um so they did this and and he was followed by people that you know it was all caught on video and everything so um yeah I'm, I, while, uh, you know, we could theoretically attract some attention, uh, by covering this, uh, honestly, I don't think that I'm really upsetting anybody there. <laughs> if anything, they're going, yeah, <laughs> now if the site gets taken down, you know, <laughs> they could do that. And, uh, but if they did, it wouldn't be because they're mad about anything I said. It just, you know, for lulls. So that you know some people just enjoy making other people's lives miserable so but jesus died for them too and all of those sins are forgivable as well yes very good job there of distinguishing law and gospel which by the way we got a we got a comment from a, a pastor torkelson i guess it's, it's from on youtube torkelson 100 so i'm guessing that uh, um, that's his last name. And he says, Hi, I'm a Lutheran pastor and believe there's a danger in making personal evangelism legalistic in sermons and mixing law and gospel. Uh, the preacher tells everyone else to do what he should be doing, proclaim the gospel. Some preachers may even think that when they tell others to evangelize, they're preaching the gospel. Evangelization, first of all, needs to come from the pulpit for everyone, Christians too. Evangelism needs to be handled with care so as not to mix law and gospel. Your thoughts? This is in uh, about our show number 120, Why Churches Are Shrinking. <clears throat> well, Pastor, there's a very good reason that Luther said whoever can divide law and, go- law and gospel properly should be made a doctrine teacher in the church. And it's a very difficult thing. Yep. Uh, Oh, the, one of the great uh, tragedies, I think, of, of uh, preachers is that we too often preach about the gospel, but we don't preach the gospel. And I think sometimes when you encourage your people to do evangelism, it's very easy to preach about the gospel. It's very easy to turn the gospel into law at that point. On the other hand, I've heard more than my share of uh, ordinations or installation sermons where they did the same thing. Uh, at my um, graduation, se- no, not uh, graduation, uh, call night at seminary, uh, Gerhard Hyatt, he used to be pro- uh, president of Concordia, St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, his sermon that he preached to us that night was all law. I thought I was the only one who, you know, noticed that, and you know, I thought maybe I was just being hypercritical. And the next day, a bunch of the sem profs said that they owed us an apology for it. Uh, the seminary would think because it was just there's no gospel there at all. So that that I mean I've heard that kind of stuff happening a lot. Um, so yes, it does need to start always with the pastor preaching the gospel to his own people. But it cannot end there. Right. And the reality is, um, when you talk about the preacher tells everyone else to do what he should be doing. Uh, namely uh, proclaiming the gospel. Well, the fact is, I can't proclaim the gospel everywhere. I'm not at my wife's work. She is. And she can proclaim the gospel to the people there where she works. Um, I'm not um, in um, Dedham Middle School. 
my kids in the confirmation are. And they can be Christ in those places. Uh, you know, that's, that's, you know, we are uh, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that we may declare the praises of him who have called us in the dark, out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Yeah, that's and if you look at that passage, that's really a, a quote almost exactly of Deuteronomy, where God says that he is that Israel is to be a nation of priests. Um and the idea then is that we carry out that that gospel, that love of God, uh wherever we go. And so we encourage our people to do just that, uh, wherever they are, to interact with the gospel. So you know is there a confusion of law and gospel on this issue? I think there often is, but then being perfectly honest, there's lot, I've heard a confusion of law and gospel on lots of issues. Um, you know, it's, it's not, you know, but again, that is the highest and most difficult of all arts. Yep. So there's my thoughts. So at the same time, um, you know, the, the, you know, like Jim's talked about the priesthood of all believers that, that we are all, you know, this, this uh, task uh, to proclaim the gospel to, you know, and, and you can argue about, uh, you know, the Greek word and, and whether proclaim is the right word or share the gospel or, or you know, or, or present the gospel or witness or, you know, or whatever. Um, but, you know, when uh, when we're told always be ready uh, to to give a reason for the joy that's within you, um, that wasn't just given to pastors, you know, that was given to everybody. And, uh, in fact, I do, uh, a, a weekly, uh, or I'm sorry, monthly, not always at the same time, uh, something I've started doing. I, I do a weekly blog for our, our congregation, um, uh, shepherdtheridge.org. And I, I, I do a monthly, this is something I started up a long time ago and then kind of stopped and, uh, started again, uh, as a district, uh, serving on the district, uh, missions board. And in Iowa, and it's something I started up again uh, for my congregation. I do something called the Evangelism Moment, and just talk about um, sharing the gospel. And and while these articles are um, are, are certainly some of them are they're they're telling about Jesus, all right, but they're not intended to be. Uh, um, it's it's they're proclaim you know about Jesus and not proclaiming Christ per se. Um, but that's not the point of these articles. They're not, they're not sermons. Um, they're, but it's because people want to share the gospel, but they don't know how. All right. And so it, it falls on us as pastors to help people to understand how to do that. And, um, and by the way, if anybody, um, is interested in using, um, any of those articles I've had, uh, different people have contacted me at different times and said, Hey, um, you know, I read this article. Do you mind if I reprint it and that, uh, by all means. And if you want to edit it, you want to change it, uh, you know, to better fit your people. Or if you disagree with something I said and you want to change it, um, that's fine too. I, I don't have a problem with that. I, I don't believe that I have the corner on wisdom or anything like mm -hmm. that. And I mean, in fact, if you disagree with me on something, uh, that I wrote, please let me know because, uh, you know, you might be right, and maybe I need to go back and change it. So, um, you know, by all means. Uh, one other thing, by the way, before we leave the subject, and that is simply, remember what we say about the Office of the Keys. The Office of the Keys is the power that Christ gave to his church right. to proclaim the forgiveness of sins, not to his pastors. Yep. It's that's the that's right of every Christian to, remember. to release and to retain sins. Okay. Um, well, I think that's it for tonight. So uh, thanks everybody for uh, coming by, and um, and I'll just, I'll just remind you that we we do want to hear from you. Uh, you can uh, you can leave, leave a note uh, uh, on to the or or um, or um, blip or wherever you are watching watching this, and and, and uh, do that. Uh, and, and, and we'll get that we'll just, like, just like uh, Pastor Charles and Dave. Appreciate, appreciate this share this comment. Um, very um, insightful. Very insightful. And, and, um, and, um, and, and also, also uh, you, you can email, email us at us podcast at cosmicosmos.com. Um, 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 and we, we just and absolutely love, love hearing, hearing back uh, from... Hey, that was a... Uh, uh, we got an opening in Missouri City. 
It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> that we did. Hey, everybody, have a good night. God bless, and we will see you next week. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless.